everyone, and thanks for tuning in. My name's Katie, and I'm the Public Programs Coordinator at the Old Treasury Building. As this is a webinar format, you're all safe. We can't see or hear you. If you have any technical difficulties, put a comment in the chat, and I'll be able to help. Um, as we go along, if you have any questions for our speaker, please place them in the Q&A, and they'll be addressed at the end. Uh, before I hand over to Margaret, I'd like to acknowledge that the Old Treasury Building, where I'm presenting from today, is located on the lands of the Kulin Nations, and we pay our respects to the traditional custodians, past and present. Sovereignty was never ceded. Now I'll pass you over to Margaret Anderson. Margaret is Director of the Old Treasury Building and was lead on the team to research and curate our Lost Job, The Changing World of Work exhibition, which is now on display in the museum until the end of 2013. Thank you, Margaret. Thanks, Katie, very much. And welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Now, what I'm going to do, because I've had a few little issues with the computer just lately, is I'm going to stop the video if that's okay. So hi, everyone, um, and thanks, Katie, for the introduction. Can I echo Katie's acknowledgement that I'm speaking to you from the unceded land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the Kulin Nation? Now, we've just opened a new exhibition at the Old Treasury Building called Lost Jobs, The Changing World of Work. It's about the kind of work that people did in the past and about the ways in which the workplace has changed over time. And we cover the whole period from about 1840 right up to the present by and large. And we can probably all think of some of the ways in which our own work has changed um, in even in recent years. So can anybody now thinking back remember the Gestetner machine, that ubiquitous machine that churned out newsletters or school exercises in countless offices before the Xerox machine took over? Or even the typewriter, who remembers secretaries? There were once thousands of them before computers made them all but redundant. COVID, of course, has brought huge changes to the way we do office work in the past two years. And that would have seemed inconceivable to the numbers of clerks who laboured away with pen and ink in offices well into the 20th century. And um, the changes that we've seen have been as recent as that. Could we have even imagined all of this work now as we work from our networked offices to our networked homes? Could we have even imagined that a decade ago? I doubt it actually. And then there are the nicknames that people use for common jobs. These are always changing along with the jobs themselves. So now we probably all know what tradies are or sparkies, and we're all too familiar with Ambos from the last two years, sadly. Um, but there are all sorts of strange titles for jobs in the past. How about a fairy tapper or a dolly boy, a nightman or a scoop boy? In the 19th and early 20th century, those jobs were all common ones. But what on earth were they? and what happened to them. As we researched the Lost Jobs exhibition, we kept coming across strange titles for jobs we never even knew existed. So today I'll share just a few of those. Now in the spirit of that wonderful series, The Worst Jobs in History, I might start with some of the jobs in the past that had pretty serious yuck factor although I'm absolutely not volunteering to try any of them. Let's start with the night man. The night man was not a security guard or a man who patrolled Melbourne streets after dark, although he did work at night. His job was a hugely important one, but it was also dirty, smelly and heavy, hard work. The night man's job was to drive his horse and cart through the back lanes of Melbourne and the suburbs, emptying household sewage from the pans of backyard privies. The sewage was known politely as night soil. During the 19th century, of course, as you probably know, they were heavily into euphemism in all sorts of ways. 
During the 19th century, before Melbourne was deep sewered, and that didn't happen until the late 1890s, most people had backyard privies. Here is a miniature model of one of those privies, um, also called sanitary or earth closets. This one dates from 1890, and it's a miniature model, um, a salesman sample. The closets were built up against the back fence of houses with an access hatch to the back laneway. If you live in an older suburb, you'll probably still have those back laneways in existence. They're extremely useful now for car access. But for many years, they were the access points for the night carts. Collecting night soil was an extremely smelly business, as you can imagine. And for that reason, the night carts did their rounds at night. The full pans were collected from each house, emptied into the wagon. Yes, yuck, let's hope the wagon was well lined and replaced. One of those night soil pans is held in the collection of Museums Victoria, and we've borrowed it for the exhibition. And before you ask, I'm quite sure that it was suitably sanitized first. Once the wagon was full, it was driven to a collection depot, mostly on the outskirts of the town or the city. Well, that was what was supposed to happen anyway. In the 1850s, there was a collection depot on Flemington Road near where Royal Park is now. But of course, the point is that it was right on the edge of town. You might think of that if you wander through Royal Park now and look at those lovely tall trees. In the 1870s, the night saw was often then sold on to market gardeners. Don't think about it. No wonder typhoid was rife in Melbourne for most of the later 19th century. And of course, people being people, not all nightmen did the right thing. Collection depots were often some distance from where the nightman did his rounds. And sometimes the temptation to dump the lot in the streets or even in the river was just too great. In 1875, three nightmen were charged with dumping night soil in the Yarra near Richmond. The newspaper reported from the court case that followed, the filthy brutes, the commentator said, to save themselves trouble and expense, had formed a shallow reservoir for night soil on the bank of the river and had then cut a race from the reservoir to the river. 52 loads had been emptied in this way. No wonder the owner of a nearby refreshment room complained that he and his family were often sick. Maybe not the best choice of refreshment room for your cream tea at the time, perhaps. Of course, most nightmen just did their jobs and it was not the most desirable of ways to earn a living. As deep sewers were dug throughout the city, the number of backyard privies dwindled. But you might be surprised to learn that nightmen were still working in the outer suburbs of Melbourne in the 1990s. One of the last on the job was a man called Ron Graham who collected night soil in sunshine starting at 3 a.m. He retired in 1995, and we've borrowed the cap he wore to protect his head from Museums Victoria to show in the exhibition. Because unlike many other nightmen, Ron actually carried the full pails balanced on his head, and the cap was partly to protect his head. So next time you pass one of those back laneways, Spare a thought for the nightmen and their loaded carts who passed up and down them weekly for well over a century. So moving on, but keeping with the theme as it were, we come to Scoop Boys. Until well into the 20th century, Melbourne was the city of the horse with the inevitable consequences. There were literally thousands of working horses in the city. One estimate suggested that a thousand horses could deposit 2,200 litres of urine and 10 tonnes of manure onto the streets in an eight hour day. And there were a lot more than a thousand horses in the city. The solution, the solution was to employ a small army of boys aged between 14 and 18 to clean up the mess. Officially, they were all called orderlies but there were different jobs involved. Popularly, they were known as scoop boys, 
pickers, broomies, sweepers, or block boys. At the top of the hierarchy were the broomies or sweepers, who in 1910 were paid about a pound a week. Scoopers or pickers were paid 15 shillings, while juniors were paid about 12 shillings. And I'm thinking, looking at this slide, that we're looking at a junior here. He looks pretty young, doesn't he? And poor little chap, he looks pretty ragged too. You can see all the tears and the mends in his clothing and, and his coat doesn't look very warm, does it? It was a dirty job, involved being out in all weathers, but there are always plenty of candidates, partly because there was a chance of promotion, I guess, and partly because it was steady work. It was probably better than having to line up for day labouring work, say on the wharf at daybreak. Of course, it could also be dangerous. The scoop boys in particular had to run, dodge in and out of the traffic on the busy roads and accidents were common. In 1906, the pickers or scoop boys actually went on strike. And one young lad was quoted as saying it was too risky a job for 15 bob a week. The scoop boys and broomies are also a bit notorious. Apparently their language could be fairly colorful and they were not above getting their revenge on any passerby who annoyed them. One of their favorite pranks was to lob manure into passing vehicles just for a lark. And the council got lots of complaints about that sort of thing. Let's hope it was dry manure, but we don't know. In 1910, the Melbourne City Council employed 50 boys to do this work. But as cars replaced horses, of course, fewer boys were needed until the scoop boy disappeared altogether. And very few people would now know what he did. Today's horses, of course, all wear discreet little bags under their tails, but no one thought to do that in the 19th century. Perhaps just as well, all the scoop boys would have all been out of a job sooner. Now, quite apart from animals in the city, and there were a lot of them, 19th century Melbourne was a very smelly place. In the early days, before backyard privies even, most people used cesspits to store household wastes of all kinds. And these were supposed to be brick lined, or in this case, as you can see here, stone lined holes dug into backyards. And they were used as toilets and waste disposal sites. They were supposed to be dug out regularly, but of course that didn't always happen. And although they were lined, as we can see here, they were not sealed. And so when fall or when it rained heavily, they often leaked. And when they leaked, raw sewage could seep into backyards and from there into the streets. Sounds positively medieval, doesn't it? And to all intents and purposes, it was. The sanitary arrangements in Melbourne for a good deal of the 19th century were not that far from many medieval cities. If you add to that the many butcher shops and other food sellers who often just dump their rubbish in the drains, you begin to get a picture of a pretty unsavory environment. Enter the inspector of nuisances. From the late 1850s, people began to be concerned about the links between dirt and disease. This was just about the time that germ theory was finally gaining ground in scientific circles. Over the next few decades, most local councils appointed inspectors to hunt out what they called nuisances and to order those responsible to clean them up. If they failed to do that, the inspector could bring them to court and fine them. Now, unfortunately, we haven't been able to find a photograph of a single one of these gentlemen to show you, but their work was reported regularly in the local newspapers. And so we have a fair idea what sort of things they did. In 1864, for example, the inspector in Melbourne issued 616 notices of nuisances for overflowing cesspits or privies. And 26 of those cases finished up in court. Cesspits were pretty well redundant by the late 1870s, but there were still cases of overflowing household pits in the 1880s and 90s. Now, inspectors often had a heavy workload because most of them had a combination of jobs to do. 
In Melbourne, that included inspecting food for sale in markets and on the street, clearing the streets of obstructions, visiting dangerous buildings and dealing with straying animals. And we can see the range of tasks the inspectors took on from a rather wonderful day book kept by one assistant inspector in Melbourne in the late 1890s. It included all sorts of visits to premises and many still concerned overflowing pans in closets, water closets that is. Residents were frequently cautioned to quote, get some disinfectant. It was certainly not a job for the faint hearted. In 1888, the inspector of nuisances for the Melbourne City Council sniffed out a stench coming from Hall's livery stables. He found that an attendant crowd was quote, paying admission to see an exhibition of carcasses of dead sharks and other fish. None in preservative, of course. Even decomposing whales were sometimes exhibited in this way, and you can't even imagine what the stench from that would have been like. In smaller councils, the responsibilities were even broader. One of the earliest inspector of nuisances in Moorabbin was a man named John Bodley. In 1874, he was appointed as rate collector, dog inspector, clerk of works and collector of statistics at a salary of 90 pounds per annum, which was a modest salary. In October, 1882, he took on the additional responsibility of inspector of nuisances at the vastly increased salary of 175 pounds, which was quite a respectable salary. Very good salary for the times, but of course it could be a pretty unpleasant job. Now most work in the 1800s was hands-on, but there are other jobs that made use of arms and legs as well. Have you ever heard of the leech collectors? Do I see you squirm? Well, you might, because the mental picture you have is probably an accurate one. Leeches were hugely popular for medicinal use in the 19th century, as they had been for hundreds of years. And this is a, an engraving from the 18th century. They had all sorts of applications, from simple bloodletting to reducing inflammation in wounds and joints. Most pharmacists will keep a jar like this one, filled with leeches. Doctors applied leeches in all sorts of places, including, believe it or not, to the tonsils for tonsillitis, or even to the cervix to treat menstrual pain. It's hard to imagine submitting to that sort of thing, isn't it? And you'll be relieved to know though, that in cases like that, it was recommended that a string be attached to the tail of the leech so that it could be withdrawn once replete. Hope you're not having your morning tea just now. It does get worse though. Leeches were so popular that they became extremely hard to find in Britain and Europe. And one of the lesser known exports from Victoria was live leeches. Leech merchants paid collectors to wade in muddy water and allow leeches to attach themselves to their bodies. Once they were, they were enough, they were squeezed or flicked off and stored in clean water. Poor old horses were also used, being made to stand in the water until they were literally covered in the parasites. And you can see that from this um, engraving from the 19th century. One of the biggest leech merchants in Melbourne was Frederick Grimwade. He was known to contract First Nations collectors near Echuca, paying them 10 shillings per thousand collected. And some collected as many as 2,500 in a day. The leeches were then exported to London where they sold for three times the local price. And in the interim, Grimwade stored his leeches in his leech aquarium in Melbourne. This is the only picture that we could find of it. And it was a tiny little um, inset in a bigger picture. So I hope you can see it there. In the 20th century, of course, bloodletting fell out of favor and the leech trade was abandoned. But interestingly enough, leeches are still used in modern medicine to help heal skin grafts and to restore blood circulation to wounds. You'll be relieved to know now that they are now sourced from specialized leech farms where they're raised in sterile conditions and collected humanely. 
Now, incidentally, some of you may know that Grimwade's business partner for many decades was Alfred Fenton, source of the famous Fenton bequest to the National Gallery of Victoria. So next time you pass one of the pictures purchased from the Fenton bequest, spare a thought for those First Nations leech collectors. At least part of the Fenton Grimwade fortune was built, literally, on the blood of First Nations people along the Murray. Now, I hope I haven't put you all off too much. Time for a change of scene, I think. Let's pay a visit to the railways, where there were quite a few unusual jobs in the past. In the late 19th century, the Victorian Railways was a huge business enterprise. In 1891, it employed over 14,000 men, mostly men. By 1950, it was even larger with a workforce of 27,000 men, employed in some 500 different jobs. And we mostly know about train drivers, station masters, even probably the train guards, the porters, the signalmen. But there were many other jobs that were much more unusual, even a few that were quite unique. One of my favourites was simply called a station officer at Flinders Street Station. But his job was to change the times on the clocks to show the next departure time for the train on each suburban line. Before automation in, 18, in 1983, these clocks were adjusted by a man using a long pole. The end of the pole was inserted into the bottom of each clock to move the hands to the departure time for the next train on each line. He was one of the busiest workers in the station, especially in peak hour. In an eight hour shift in 1960, it was estimated that the clocks were changed 900 times. And the timing had to be accurate to the minute, of course. Here is one of those officers identified only as Steve on the job in 1960s. The railways initially planned to replace the clocks with automated displays in 1983, but there was such a public outcry that they left the clocks in place, but they are now updated by computer. There were once a great many clocks in railway stations throughout Victoria, all maintained by officers under the supervision of the Victorian Railway's official watch and clock repairer. Here he is at work in 1950. And in 1950, the position was the man who occupied that position had followed his father into the job. The watch and clock repair shop was housed upstairs in the old Spencer Street station complex. But the times on all the main station clocks were controlled via the big clock at Flinders Street Station. The clock, watch and clock repair shop was just one of many jobs behind the scenes in the Victorian railways. Then there was the man in grey. Some of you may remember him. There was a man in grey at both the Flinders Street and the Spencer Street stations. Their job was to provide information about timetables, departure times, fares, platforms, and so on. They were said to have prodigious memories. In 1937, the man in grey at Flinders Street was given a public address system with speakers on various points around the station and on platform number one. This was the departure platform for country trains, especially those off to the seaside. But during World War II, it was also the departure platform for volunteers enlisting in the services and throughout the war. And in throughout the war, the man in grey invariably ended his announcements with the words, good luck boys. The man in grey service came to an end in the 1970s, but he was remembered fondly for many years afterwards. But I think perhaps my favourite job in the railways was one of the jobs for boys. This was the call boy, also known as a caller up. The job of the caller up was to go out at night or in the early morning and wake up the engine drivers or firemen for their shifts. Most of them were boys aged between 14 and 18. Now, it seems that they often slept in the railway depots and then cycled out to wake a list of drivers they were given. And the drivers were supposed to live within a 45 minute cycle ride of the depot. 
The drivers or firemen each collected a copper disc before leaving for home the day before, and they had to hand this to the caller up to prove that he'd been there to wake them. If they still didn't appear, the caller up had to go back and wait to get a signed receipt to say that he had been twice. And I imagine that the driver or the fireman then got into all sorts of trouble. And when we first read about these caller up boys, we wondered who on earth woke up the call boys, since this was a time before reliable alarm clocks. But it seems that since they slept at the depots, they were probably woken in their turn by others who were on the night shift, given their list and allocated a bicycle. We don't know when the system ended, but it was a very common way to start as an apprentice in the railways for many years. And then there were the gatekeepers. As so many of the level crossings disappear around Melbourne now, it's timely to remember that for many years, these crossings were manned by gatekeepers who opened and closed the gates for passing traffic. There was once a gatekeeper for just about every level crossing in, or certainly in Melbourne and in country towns. And then some of them were kept very busy. Sometimes they lived in houses on site and you can see, so see some pictures of that sometimes so that they could literally be hauled out of bed at all hours to open the gates for motorists. After the last train went through each night, the gates were locked so that the gatekeeper had to be roused out of bed to open the gates for any passing motorist. Not much fun on a winter's night. In fact, one of the minor ailments afflicting gatekeepers was said to be chillblains. And one enterprising chap claimed to have made a foolproof ointment for chillblains, and he apparently did the rounds of all the gatekeepers on a regular basis. Gatekeepers were not all men. Often their wives and children helped out, and there were also quite a few women who worked as gatekeepers, sometimes the widows of former keepers, but not always. It was not a job without risk. Several gatekeepers were killed by passing trains when they misjudged the closing time, including several women. The gates themselves were apparently quite heavy to move and required serious muscle power. At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that lots of jobs had popular nicknames in the past, just as they do now. One that really took our fancy in researching this exhibition was the fairy tapper. What on earth was a fairy tapper, we wondered. Well, nothing like what you might imagine. In fact, a fairy tapper was a slang term for a sheet metal worker. As far as we can judge, it was not meant to be a derogatory term. It was merely just a, a popular descriptive term because sheet metal workers shaped the sheets of iron using lots of tiny taps with small hammers, hence fairy tappers. It was exacting work requiring judgment and skill. And sheet metal workshops were very far from fairyland as workplaces. They were extremely noisy environments and often dirty. But it was skilled work and was rewarded with a skilled tradesman's wage. Not so the Dolly Boys, who were young lads, often apprentices. Did they work for toy makers, you might imagine? Well, no, they didn't. Dolly Boys also worked in metal workshops, and their job was probably one of the most unpleasant in the factory. In the Sunshine Harvester workshop in the early 20th century, the Dolly Boy's job was to place rivets in holes in the grain header of harvesters. They had to crawl into these metal boxes where they lay on their backs all day, placing rivets in holes and then keeping them in place with a tool called a dolly, hence the dolly boy. A man on the outside of the box would then ram the rivet home with a hammer. Now you can imagine what the noise was like inside that header. Men remembering this work said that at the end of a the day, they would come out with their ears ringing for hours afterwards. An industrial deafness was a common result. Of course, there was no safety protection at that point. And the boys had to place 600 rivets per day. If their attention wandered or they were new 
and fail to put the dolly in place in time because they were a bit slow, their fingers could be caught by the hammer. It was a very common injury. So not at all a fun job and a job with a high risk of long-term injury. Now, so far, almost all of the odd jobs we've talked about have been done by men. And that's mainly because most of the jobs women did are pretty well known. But there is one job that confuses people nowadays, and that is the wet nurse. What did she do? Was this some kind of obscure job in a hospital? Well, no, it wasn't. Most wet nurses worked in private homes, although some did work in institutions. Wet nurses were women who breastfed other people's babies. Often they were working women whose own babies had died either at birth or soon afterwards. Sometimes if the woman was very poor, she might put her own baby out to be looked after while she fed someone else's child. But that was a desperate choice because most of those babies died. In some even more desperate circumstances, a woman might kill her own baby and then seek a job as a wet nurse. We know of one famous case in which this was what happened, that of Maggie, Maggie Heffernan, although there is, there is no implication that that was what she intended to do. Maggie Heffernan was a respectable young woman who was seduced and then abandoned by a man who had quite a reputation. She gave birth to a little boy in the women's hospital in Melbourne, far away from her family, but then was left with no resources whatever to care for her little boy. In desperation, some weeks later, she dropped him in the Yarra. The next day, she went back to the hospital and reported his death, asking for a job as a wet nurse. There was always a demand for wet nurses from women who couldn't breastfeed their own babies. And as we've seen, um, hand rearing a baby, even in the late 19th century, was still a very risky proposition. There were also lots of abandoned babies who were placed in orphanages and needed to be fed. Now, unfortunately for Maggie, the body of her baby was fished out of the river, identified, and she was tried and subsequently found guilty of murder. Now, a sympathetic court actually recommended mercy for Maggie, and in the end, she was spared the hangman's noose. Which brings me to our last odd job, rather a gruesome one, the hangman. As you probably know, death by hanging was the compulsory sentence for anyone convicted of murder in Victoria until 1975. For the few decades before this, it became more common for the sentence to be commuted. But that decision could only be made by the Executive Council, that is, by the Governor in meeting with the Cabinet. No court could make that decision. Until the 1850s, hangings were carried out in public, but after that, they were performed within the confines of the jails. And the hangmen were usually inmates themselves, some were thought to be rather vicious men, but that might just be because that was what was associated with the job. Because the hangman was always despised, his identity was kept secret, and most wore disguises as well, apparently. Even though other inmates were always locked in their cells during executions. But after 1900, hangmen were usually appointed from outside the prison service and some apparently had quite high standing in society. Their shadowy job was kept secret. One of the most extraordinary documents on show in the Lost Jobs exhibition is the Hangman's Journal, which is a, a document in the possession of Public Record Office Victoria, and it details every execution carried out. At the back of the journal is a handwritten so-called table of drops the calculation issued in 1892 by the British Home Office, which specified the length of the rope or the drop needed to execute a prisoner instantly based on height and body weight. It's a rather gruesome document for a gruesome occupation. Now that might be a rather sombre note on which to end this talk. So perhaps let's briefly touch on a couple more odd jobs. <laughs> 
Let's start with the phrenologist. A phrenologist believed that a person's character and personality could be read by studying the shape of the skull, including any bumps. Things like the spacing of the eyes and the shape of the forehead were thought to be especially important. Phrenologists were especially interested in trying to identify the so-called criminal type, and they tried to study the skulls of prison inmates to reach conclusions. Ned Kelly was especially interesting, apparently. Of course, it was complete nonsense, what we would now call a pseudoscience, but it was very popular in the mid 19th century when busts like this one were created to allow phrenologists to read people's skulls. By the end of the century, the whole business was discredited and popular phrenologists retreated to fairgrounds and arcades alongside the palm readers and the fortune tellers where they made a living preying on the credulous. Now there were many other unusual jobs in the past, including some that sound quite familiar. The electrician, for instance. We all know what electricians do, or do we? In the late 19th century, he might also be called a galvanist. Now, I hope you can see this. It's a bit of a fuzzy slide, but in the bottom right corner, you can just see um, a stand and, and the galvanist sign on, on, his, on his stall. Remember that electricity wasn't introduced to Melbourne in a formal sense until the late 1880s. So what on earth did this galvanist do in the 1870s? Well, it seems he operated from a street school and gave small electric shocks to people for a fee. In truth, it seems that you could find just about anything for sale on the streets of Melbourne. And on that lighthearted note, I think we might end our talk today. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. That was really fascinating. Uh, now, while everyone types their questions into the Q&A, um, and Margaret takes a bit of a break. Um, I'll let you know that she's continuing the discussion of lost jobs at the end of the month on Thursday, the 28th of April at 11 a.m. with Lost Jobs in the City, the city being Melbourne. And it's presented as part of the National Trust's Heritage Festival. Tickets are available on our website and through Eventbrite. Now, first question. Uh, why would people want to view a decomposing fish? <laughs> Very good question, Katie. Why indeed? I think probably it, it was, it's part of um, that, that fascination in the 19th century um, with so many different um, animals and species from the Antipodes. Um, and that's, that's the only thing I can suggest is that people didn't know what the... The, the fauna and flora and the fish was like. And so actually seeing samples in the flesh, as it were, was all they could do. And that's before there was a museum or anything like that. And before even people had published the sort of um, compendia of, of these unknown animals um, so that people could study them. Now that's, that's speculation. I really don't know. I can't imagine. There's certainly no way that I would have been lining up to see decomposing fish, let alone a decomposing whale. I mean, and I think that it was a bit earlier, actually, but there definitely was a whale that was exhibited in Melbourne for a week, apparently. And I don't know if anybody's ever smelled a decomposing whale, but I can tell you, because I have, that it is almost unbelievable. Um, the leech jar. Do we know how long a leech would survive in that? No, but they used to, uh, quite some time, I think, because apparently what they used to do was change um, the water regularly. They had to be in fresh water. Um, I don't even know much about leeches. I don't know whether they breathe oxygen from the water. I guess they must. Um, but anyway, that was, the, that was the idea that you changed the water. But obviously you could store them for quite some time because Grim Wade had that... Um, Oh, somebody's saying, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be reading the chat. <laughs> um, because he used to store them in his, his aquarium and then he used to ship them off to, to London. Um, so presumably they could be kept for months. Um, a lot of these jobs sound very dangerous. 
Um, when did PPC and OHS come into common use? Oh, that's very recent. <laughs> all, the, all those sorts of terms are probably post 1970s, 1980s. But in fact, there were some attempts um, to make um, work safer beginning in the sort of late decades of the 19th century. The Factory Act um, from the 1870s began in the 1870s and they started to regulate the hours that people could work. Um, they started to insist that some machinery, dangerous machinery, for example, was fenced. Um, they started to prevent small children um, being allowed to work in factories because little kids, especially if they worked in textile um, factories, could sometimes get caught in the machinery. And there are really terrible tales, you know, of little kids falling asleep and falling into machinery. And it's really, it's terrible. Very sad. Um, but, but other things in other workplaces, I mean, you see extraordinary pictures of people working in the mines with absolutely no protection. Um, and of course, miners died of tysis, um, oh, black rot, they used to call it, I think, um, well into the 20th century. So there were, there were diseases um, that were associated with occupations. And, and the after effects of these of this sort of work was well known, but it took many, many years um, to force employers to adopt safety precautions. And of course, still ongoing, isn't it? As we know. Yeah. An interesting um, comment. As fairy tappers were metal workers, could fairy be a corruption of ferrous, as in iron? No, I don't know. I hadn't thought of that, but I suppose it might have been. I guess it could be. Yeah, my, my understanding from a colleague who um, worked, uh, managed, managed the Maritime Museum in South Australia for many years, who was the one who told me about fairy tappers, is that it was all to do with the fact that they used little, little hammers and there were lots of tiny taps. But who knows? I mean, all sorts of things are possible, aren't they? They definitely are. Okay, next question. Um, I'm not sure if up with this one. While browsing Sands and McDougall, I came across the term fancy repository. Someone gave their address as the at the fancy uh, with the street address. Their guess was that it was something like an op shop. Have you have you come across the term before, Margie? Fancies. Well, in a sort of a way, maybe. I mean, uh, it was used in association with needlework fancy work so-called was um embroidery and all sorts of other work bead work um you know that sort of thing um so it might have been associated with that i haven't seen um an advertisement like that one it's intriguing um that would be worth that's a question worth asking um our colleague lorinda kramer at um at um the Catholic University, isn't it? Because she's she's written about um, women's needlework in the 19th century. So she might actually be able to answer that. Um, we might forward it to her. And so if you want to, um, whoever asked that question, um, if you want to leave a, a contact email or something, we might actually be able to answer that subsequently. But that, that is probably my first guess, but it's only a guess. Uh, oh, going back to the railways, what did you mean that the clocks were controlled by the big clock at Flinders Street Station? Ah, yes, yeah, so it um, it's, it's a bit of a complex one, this one. Um, and that is, of course, not the clocks that show the departure times because they're being controlled. Um, they're being controlled by the man with the pole. It's the other clocks. The, um, and apparently what they all had was some sort of connection. Now, how that worked, I do not know. Um, because it obviously couldn't have been a physical one. So maybe it was some sort of electrical connection. I don't know. But every other clock apparently had two prongs above the one. And every hour on the hour, those two prongs used to come down um, onto the hands of the clock and drag the, the um, big hand, I suppose, as you'd say to the kids, <laughs> onto the 12. When the Flinders Creek um, Street clock moved to the hour, um, all of those little prongs would come down, move each clock's hand to the 12, and if it, if it had wavered either, if it was fast or slow, they would drag it back in place. 
Um, so that's how it worked. But how those clocks got the signal, that I cannot tell you. I don't know. Thank you, Margaret. And thank you to everyone for attending. And we hope to see you again on the 28th for Lost Jobs in the City. Have a good day. Thanks, Katie. Bye, everyone. Bye.